bring greetings from my home church, CFC South. And this is my first Sunday that I'm not there. And I feel, I have to admit, like I've, I sent a pile of text saying, send me pictures and stuff like that, because I just have a bit of fear of missing out. And it, it does feel a bit weird. Like, it's kind of like my, the first day I sent my kids to school and I just wanted to just be there outside the gates spying on them the whole time. But it does look a bit creepy, you know, like you're, you're the, the guy creep, you know, peeping through the gate and, and then you realise, yeah, this doesn't look good, I need to get back in the car and just leave this place in Jesus' name. It's uh, great to be here and um, Pastor Bill, um, as many of you know, uh, he's recovering from uh, quite a significant surgery and just this week when I, I saw him a couple of times, he's actually doing so much better this week, he, he's taken a little while to... Uh, recover from his surgery but he's in good spirits and I think it's driving him a bit crazy not being able to get straight back into work so I think he's doing a mixture of reading and working and watching YouTube videos of snooker at the moment Um, but he passes on his love to you all. This series relationship goals is really important because as a community, as a society, the, our, our economy, our GDP uh, per capita, technological advancements, everything in our society should be getting better. Yet, much research into the Western world says that the quality of our relationships is diminishing. The quality of our interpersonal relationships, the quality of our family relationships, the family, the the. The, the quality of relationships in organisations like the church and sporting clubs and the quality of so-called online relationships is diminishing. So how can we be a church that doesn't just embrace the value of relationships, but how do we actually do relationships? Because we all want good relationships, but how does this work? And I believe this is a space where the church is called to be a prophetic witness to the world that there is a radical way. You know, you know, I'm drawn to, I love radicals. Like when I hear, and one of my favourite, some of you this is completely irrelevant to, but I love even people that I politically disagree with. I love it when people are radically on fire with a conviction that burns in their heart and it manifests out of their mouth and out of their body. And it's like, this person really believes what they say. I mean, I love, I'm drawn to politicians that I might disagree with their politics, but I feel like they really mean what they say and they're trying to make a difference in this world, even if my vision of what the world that they want to create might be different to the world that I think Jesus would have. Um, one of my favourite um, public intellectuals in the United, the, from the United States is a... a a uh, African-American black preacher called, well, not preacher, academic, Cornell West. Whenever he speaks, I just, I just want to start worshipping Jesus. Even though politically he is not, he's not just left-wing, he is like so far left, he's basically a Marxist. But he is, but when he talks about Jesus, I'm just like, well, someone give me an amen. Like he is, he is amazing. Um, and I think our world needs a revolution of sacrificial love. We don't just need to tweak the edges. We don't just need to massage the, the mechanics of the way we relate. That when, um, at the moment, I'm preparing a couple of, uh, three couples that are about to get married, and uh, two of them are not part of the church. They don't think they go to any church. And, and they said, well, we want you to marry us. I said, well, that's fine. Why don't you just get a celebrant? That'd be heaps easier. Um, and they said, no, we want you. And I'm like, all right, if you get me, I'm going to talk about Jesus at your wedding. I can't talk about love if I don't talk about Jesus. And I'm not just going to talk about Jesus, the, the nice guy that used to hug sheep, apparently. I'm going to talk about the one that died on the cross. So your wedding is going to include talking about Jesus dying on the cross. Because for me, that is the radical message of Christian marriage. It's, and, and, and I say, I'm going to talk, when, when, when you fall out of love, then you get to love. <laughs> 
When the, the romance fades, then you choose to love and then the romance comes back. But some days you wake up and the romance ain't there, babies. <laughs> Maybe if you are the exception in every day of your life, if you, if the romance is just firing 10 out of 10, please stand up now. Okay. So in my case, as I like to say, I, got, I was blessed to, to marry the woman, to love, to, to marry the woman I love. But now I get to love the woman I marry. And so Christian marriage is not about a contract, it's about a covenant that is a reflection of God's unconditional love for us. And it is radical and it actually does not make logical sense because sacrifice by its very nature is not fair. And it costs. But there's a beauty to love that resonates because guess what? At the heart of the universe is not a cosmic mystery of nothingness. At the heart of the universe is a God that was and is and is to come and He is not just an idea. He is a society of love. He is Father, Son and Holy Spirit and in love He created. And so when we see love, when we experience love, we are resonating not just with here and now but with eternity. The God that birthed and created the world out of love and has a plan for not just this world, but a new creation. And it's out of his love for his creation. So Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The mark of this church should be that people walk in and they see there's something about the fibre of the church that is loving, even more important than the worship and even more important than the preaching, is the loving nature of the church towards one another. In fact, we, we, mission is important. Reaching out beyond the, the walls of the church is really important, but you cannot be a missionary church if you are not starting with the, the genesis of loving one another. In fact, the Bible tends to overemphasize the importance of loving brothers and sisters in Christ first. Because that's like the engine room, and then out of that overflow comes mission and love for others. So the goal of the church is not to dilute the quality of the love within the church. It's to open the borders on the fringes of the church so more people can enter into the family of God. In the Old Testament, many times it says you should love one another, you should love your neighbour, you should even love your enemy. But here Jesus is saying, don't just love each other, don't just love your enemy, love as I have loved you. And just previously in um, this passage in John chapter 13, Jesus has literally washed his disciples' feet as saying, this is how all in I am, in my love for you leading up to the cross. And then in 1 John 3 verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. This is like Jesus 101. You've heard it said, love, and can I just say, if you think the teachings of Jesus are easy, you're not reading Jesus enough. Like Jesus is just the most radical teacher and prophet that's ever lived like he spits fire with his prophecy and when you're confronted with the teaching of Jesus it should almost overwhelm you by how impossible it is and then you're just like Jesus I need your help when you read the Sermon on the Mount it should be borderline this is impossible but it shouldn't crush you it should inspire you that because of God you can Live the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Even the pagans do that. The place where your faith will be tested is how are you going in your love life where it's not on your terms? How are you going in loving the people that are just so darn frustrating and so unworthy of love? 
How are you going loving those people? How are you going loving that sibling that just knows how to find that bruise and they dig their thumb into that bruise metaphorically and they just annoy you so much and they remind you of everything that you would be without Jesus and you, and you just can't be around them. Or that work colleague that just, oh, God, please, may they quit. <laughs> or, or that person that hates you or judges you unfairly. And you just feel like you're a victim of their attitude and their prejudice. How are you going in loving these people? Can I just invite you to close your eyes and maybe just open your hands as a sign of openness because I, I want to hand over some relationships right now. Now, the word frustration is a really... When I, even when I just think about frustration, I get frustrated. Some of you, you know, when, you're, when you have someone that's behind you and they've obviously got road rage and you go slower, <laughs> there's frustration towards relationships in your life. I want you to think about the people you're frustrated towards, the people that you're struggling to love. Right now, I want you to think about someone that you're struggling to tolerate and love in your life. And I just, just hand them over to God and just say, God, help me to love this person. I want you to think about someone that you feel doesn't like you or hasn't given you a fair go. Maybe someone that's treated you poorly. They've been prejudiced towards you. You pray for them now. Just say, God, help me to love this person. Maybe think about that family member that just knows how to hurt you. Right now, just say, God, help me to love that person. What about the person that refuses to change? You've asked them to change. You've asked them to adapt, but they keep on doing the same thing over and over. And God's saying to you today, I want to help you to love that person. Thank you, Lord. Can I just say, this is where we need a revolution. We need a revolution in our church. Can I just tell you some stories of some people in um, our church, um, my home church, CFC South, uh, about 40 minutes from here. Pastor Nathan Betch is actually preaching this morning. I thought I need a safe pair of hands to preach while I'm not there. <laughs> Nathan Betcher it is. Man with the best voice in radio, I reckon. Um, you know, actually, I, I see that um, Michael and Nicole are here today. Let me tell you about some people in our team. I remember my friend Dan Pizelak rang me and he said, oh, I had a great interaction with a guy today. He's the courier. And it was a 42-degree day. And so me and some of the lads just decided we're going to help him unload his, his truck. And that person was Michael. And Michael's here today. And God was at work in Michael's life already. So see, and, and, and at the start of the day, Dan made a commitment with the other guys at his work saying, we're going to be on the lookout for opportunities to bless people. And so when he saw the opportunity, even though it's 42 degrees and you're like, well, that's not my job, that's the career's job, they stepped in and they helped and they blessed. The power of love. And then earlier this year, Dan had the privilege of marrying Michael and Nicole. And it was a, it was a beautiful, and, it, and I had the, the privilege of being at that service and God, God was already at work in their life. But he was looking for someone to reach out in love. To because do you know what? Jesus forgives, but we can extend forgiveness through our actions. Jesus loves people, but we can extend the love of Jesus with our actions. Let me tell you about my wife, Nikki. Some of you know her. She comes home from the shops earlier this year and said that she's asked a stranger for his phone number. And she said, I'm just telling you because there was a man that was obviously so unwell, she said, I could smell something from two rows along 
And she said everyone was walking away from him. And she felt suddenly so concerned that she went straight up to him and said, are you all right? And, and basically they had this conversation and she looked up and asked, tried to get a bit of his story. But obviously um, he was having a really tough time and I think he had some sort of a, a disability and um, like an intellectual disability. And so she got his number. And then when she got home, she called and she spoke to his kids and made sure that he was being looked after and he was in an environment where he could be looked after. I'm like, God, thank you. I have a wife that cares about people enough to not just walk past. These are people, these are people in our leadership team at church. Claire. Um, Claire has been reaching out to a teenage girl who can't live at home anymore and she's been advocating for this girl and she's been going to school and having meetings with staff and she's been trying to find housing for this girl and um, she just is like a magnet for looking for people that need help. I'm so thankful I get to serve with people like this. Um, Chelsea and Emmett, who some of you know, just um, at the start of this year, they served in kids' church for four months solid without a break and didn't make one service in that time because they love the children in our church. And it came to the point where I basically had to ban them. I'm like, no, nah, no more, because it just they were going to burn out. But... This is what we do when we love people that aren't just... Like when you're in kids' ministry, let me tell you, you don't do it on your terms. It's not like, oh, this fills my bucket and this f- fulfills every need that I have. No, no, that's sacrifice, getting up early. It's, it's like some of you that have got kids, you're like, man, I just want to survive my own kids and leave them in kids' church, not stay with them. But you know what? Do you love the kids? Do you love them? Like this is actually the quality and the fibre of a community of love. Hey, uh, when I was thinking about a great story about loving warts and all, aren't warts unlovable? I mean, I don't care how much I love you. If you've got a a, a big wart on your finger and you try to hug me, I'm just going to push you away. (sighs) But I digress. Um, Luke 7 Jesus has just done some incredible uh, miracles. He actually he does a double decker miracle, uh, and it's incredible. He's been teaching. He's been laying down some of his um, teaching and his doctrine, and people are coming from all around to hear about him. And then he does two incredible miracles at the start of, of, of Luke chapter seven. And then we pick it up. Then one of the Pharisees, because you know what, when you start healing people, you start attracting attention, and that's what happens here. One of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So he's eating at the table and he's munching away on his garlic bread, having a chat. And then it says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life, how's that for a reputation? Learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Can we just think about the timeline of this? Jesus is reclining at the table of a religious leader, a scholar in the Bible, and the the word gets out onto the street that Jesus is there and she has obviously had some sort of interaction with him, some sort of knowledge of him, that she feels compelled to draw near to him in this Pharisee's house with an expensive bottle of perfume. Do you imagine some time, since Jesus arrived at the house, you can imagine it probably would have been an hour, two hours before she actually got there, but by the time that the word got out. So some time had elapsed. This sinful woman came with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping. Can I just say, have you ever wept at the feet of Jesus? Maybe because you feel so unworthy. Maybe because he's so beautiful. Maybe because when you look at his face, you see nothing that wants to shame you. Maybe when you look at him and you're at his feet, and you come with your excuses and your self-justification and he doesn't want to hear it. But he looks at you and he knows everything about you and he loves you anyway. Have you ever cried at the feet of Jesus? She began to wet his feet with her tears and then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them and poured 
perfume on them. Some of you, you just be like, man, that's uncomfortable. There's an intimacy there that pretty much everyone in the room felt uncomfortable with. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Really interesting. Earlier in the chapter, the people are proclaiming when they see the healing of this man that was basically being taken off to the morgue. They're saying, surely this man is a great prophet. What's a prophet? A man ordained by God to speak forth, a man or a woman, to speak forth God's word, ordained by God. They're saying, surely this man is a great prophet. And now the religious leader is saying, this proves God would want to have nothing to do with this. And what is the disqualifier? That the person of God allows for a sinful woman, that kind of woman, to come near him and touch him. Can I just say, there's some people in this room that people have written you off because of the kind of person you are. Maybe the race, maybe your gender, maybe your background, maybe you actually have done a pattern of things in your life and you have a reputation and even you think of yourself as, I'm this kind of person. But God doesn't characterise you that way. And forbid that we as the church would pigeonhole people as that kind of person. Like there's people in society that think and assume that Christians are not favourable towards them. We have to be very careful the way we label people precious children made in the image of God. Precious children made in the image of God. I believe God is calling us, if we want to love people warts and all, when we experience this kind of scene with the sinful woman. Now, in the culture, she had a reputation for being a very sinful woman. I don't know exactly what she was renowned for, but you can use your imagination. But we need to be careful, point number one, to love the sinner, not reject the sinner. And we need to learn to hate our own sin. Do you know what I see a lot in the church? I see a lot of people saying, I'm a Christian and I love everyone in theory. But let me just tell you, brother, I love you and I I think God loves you. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. But this part of your life that's really important to you or this part of your life that you struggle with, I just want to say, I hate it. I hate that part of your life, but I love you. You're, you're my brother. And, 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 and what the person hears is just what we hate. And you know what they see is they see this. <clears throat> Do you know like some of the self-righteous Christians I've met and they're really quick to point out the kid that's crying in church. They're really quick to point out the PA that's too loud. They're really quick to point out the person that complains about the PA. (laughs) Self-righteousness manifests in different forms. But it all looks like this. And what it comes down to is your sin is worse than mine. In fact, I'm not even pointing to mine. We as Christians need to be really careful. Whenever we feel like doing this, we go, God, Imagine if this person saw all the ugliness that I've done in my life and just allow it to humble you. God doesn't want you to be a sin hater in other people. He wants you to be a lover of other people and he wants you to help them to see the light of the gospel and to have their heart changed so that they're not bound by sin and death and patterns of destruction. But he wants you to take responsibility for what you are responsible for. Last time I checked, let me tell you, I have tried really hard to change people and I've never done it once. 
I've tried really hard. I've strategized and I've written action points. I think you need to do A, B and C. And then the person rings me in a week's time and says, oh, can we meet again? I'm like, oh, have you done A, B and C? And they're like, nah. I'm like, oh my goodness. I've given you the three steps to freedom and you haven't even taken step one. But the issue is not the the issue. The issue is a matter of the heart. The issue is pain or grief or trauma or or a deep lack of trust in God. It's something that's deep within and, and God needs to help them deal with the deep things of the heart. Things that we are limited in our ability to touch. Love the sinner and hate your own sin. Can I just say as a Christian, you can't hate. You can hate evil. But you can't hate people, I'm sorry. Um, The African-American author and activist James Baldwin said this, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. Think about white supremacists. Think about Islamist terrorists. These are generally insecure men that have had hard lives and they're trying to deal with their pain by hating an enemy that is not really the enemy. It's amazing when I was talking to Nigel Rice just about the number of Islamist potential terrorists that are coming to Christ because they have a yearning in their heart for something more. And let me tell you, blowing people up is not what God has for them. Can I just say to people in this room, if you are one of those people that... In the, in the words of the text, you are like a sinful person. Not just someone that sins, but you're like a renowned sinner. Man, you're in the right place. Can I just say, God does not see you as any further away than the goody two-shoes church sympathizer that's been in the church all their life, but has like not fully received Christ into their life. Like you... If you just receive Christ into your life, he can take the passion with which you're running away from God. He can turn that around because let me tell you, the the well that you're trying to reach down to, you're not going to find what you're looking for. And and I just love the fact, do you know, I find people that, people that were, were notorious sinners, when they come to Christ, there's just a beautiful gratefulness to their understanding of the gospel that is just so pure. The greatest enemy in a church like ours, it's not unrighteousness, it's self-righteousness. Because self, the self-righteous is marked from their need, for, is, is, is numbed by their need for God. I remember Johnny Lee Clary, who was formerly the head of the Ku Klux Klan, he stood on this stage about 10 years ago and, and he talked about how hate was what he used to cover over his fears and insecurities. And once he found his identity in Christ, he was filled with love for his brothers and sisters from all races. It was amazing. I also think we need to, this, this, this Pharisee, he oriented his anger towards this sinful woman. But we need to orient our anger, not towards against people, but when people come into our life that are struggling with a sin, we need to get less angry at them and more compassionate for them. I was just talking to someone this week. I said, what if someone that's in a, in a cycle of destruction in their life, what if rather than seeing as someone that we just get frustrated and angry at, what if we saw them as someone that's really sick and they need healing? They need help because what they're doing is hurting themselves and they can't even see it. And when you start changing the orientation of your thinking towards people, what you find is you start loving on them, you start praying, them, praying for them and you just become for them, even if you're not for what they're doing. Does that make sense? I just want you to think about some people in your life that you're not for what they're doing. But maybe what you need to do is you need to stop cursing them with your words. And you need to start blessing them with your words. And family is sometimes the hardest to love because they just know how to annoy you the most. (laughs) Same thing. Maybe you need to start blessing them and praying for their areas of weakness. Jesus um, answered verse 40. Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? 
and he goes on to say, the one that is forgiven much. Some people in this room have this mentality that God only had to forgive me of not, my, not many sins. I was a pretty good person when I became a Christian. And then other people in this room, you're like, man, if my life was put up on a big screen here, everyone would be running out of the exits at 100 miles an hour. Let me tell you this. The person that has been forgiven much, I reckon you're so grateful for the grace of God. But for the person here that you're just like, oh yeah, I'm just a good person and I'm a Christian and yeah, God's pretty lucky to have me. (laughs) In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we were made alive through Christ though we were dead in our sins. Let me tell you this, if you have received God's grace, gift of, if you have received God's gift of Jesus through his grace, accepted it by faith, that that is by God's gift and you were dead in your sin. And a dead person does not earn their resuscitation. They have been brought to life by the sovereign move of God and you cannot claim credit for your goodness in fact you were no closer to the mercy and the grace of God than the person that felt like they were a million miles away because both of them had in the words of the text neither of them had the money to pay back all of us are bankrupt before God and in fact in the words of Matthew chapter 5 we are blessed when we realize that we are spiritually bankrupt If you come to God with a swagger and say, yeah, and I hear people say this all the time, oh, that person, they'll be a great Christian because they're already a nice person. It's like rhubarb. That's a lie. Like, how dare we think that Christianity is just about becoming gooder and gooder and gooder. Like, that is not the gospel. The gospel, I want the gospel that turned the, 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 the Saul, the murder of Christians, into the great apostle Paul. I want the gospel that says that the person that hates the people of God and hates God can turn into someone that is willing to give their life as a sacrifice for others. I want the gospel that is good news for all people. I want the gospel that doesn't make me prideful, but makes me humble. It makes me want to serve people. You see... Just a couple of um, women in our church. Like I, um, some of you know um, Nadia, who is actually getting married on uh, on Friday, actually, and her and Tang. Now, does everyone know Tang? Some of you know Tang, who used to be part of this church. Um, he's marrying Nadia. And Nadia said to me, she said, Tim, if you had told me a few years ago that I would be a Christian, she said, I would have laughed in your face. She said, I was the last person I think would end up in church. But let me tell you, people that are like that are the most open to grow and they're the most open, they're hungry for the things of God. And you know, it was actually in this church on a a watch night service, Christmas Eve, uh, two years ago, she came into this service and she experienced the presence of the Holy Spirit and it started to crack open her heart in this church. And then she gave her life to Christ that year and now she's about to get married. And actually this morning she's singing in our team down at South, this morning. There's another girl in our church um, called, called Mim. Where's Yeah, and Mim um, has been coming to church but has not identified as a Christian um, f- forever. And then a couple of weeks ago, I saw a picture on Facebook that she got a tattoo And the tattoo said Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me and this life I live. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Nikki said, Mim, what are you doing? I didn't think you're a Christian. And she goes, I suppose I am now. (laughs) And she said, I've just felt that God is at work in my life. And she's still like, on a journey, but God was, and Nikki said, if you're going to brand yourself with a, t- a scripture, why don't you just do a motivational text rather than the gospel of co-crucifixion with Christ? But that's what she chose. You see, there's something powerful about people that would previously say, I am not part of the Jesus followers. I am not, I don't belong in the church. But when they discover it, there's a beauty and there's an openness and, and, and imagine the people. 
in our community that are going to find life in this community. Imagine the people that are going to be leading worship on this stage and they're going to have life and they're going to have joy and you're going to be there and you're going to be like, wow, I should have that joy. I've been part of this church for 17 years and I don't have as much joy as the person that's been here 17 weeks. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's exciting. Is Lee here? Lee, when you first started joining this church, you, you are a radical convert for Jesus, man. God wants to use you to disciple other people. There's more people that are where you were before you found Christ. I want more Lees up here. Next time I come here, I want more Lees up here. Can you organise that? All right. So total desperation leads to gratefulness. How do we love people? How do we love people what's and all? We're just aware of our own depravity, basically. We're aware of our own, we don't walk around with the swagger of how good we are. We walk around with the utter shock that God would love us unconditionally. He has shown mercy and grace to you. And when you realise that, man, the power of love to break down those walls is incredible. Verse 43, Simon replied, I suppose the one that had the bigger debt... uh, the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Peter, Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put any oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. You know what that tells me? Jesus was in this meal. He was in this house probably for a couple of hours. Let's just say at least an hour, probably a couple of hours. He's eating. He's been ministering. He's tired. He's got sore feet. He's apparently a great prophet. They didn't even pour him a bowl of water to wash his feet. What does that tell you? They were still in that mode of, we want to get something from you, Jesus. They weren't there to worship him. Now, the thing that's interesting about Jesus is he turns a blind eye to that. He doesn't get annoyed. He doesn't throw his weight around. He turns a blind eye to it until they have a go at this woman. And then he says, you lot, who are you to point out this woman when I'm here among you and you have basically neglected me? When I was reading that, I just thought, Imagine how many times Jesus must have turned a blind eye to his frustrations. There's actually very little frustration in the Gospels compared to how frustrated I would be with the disciples. Like, he just is so gracious because he is building into them for three years, investing into these young men and women um, in the broader disciples, investing, 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 and he's just so patient. And there's little glimmers when, when they understand and when they get his mission, he gets excited. Can I just say, if you want to love people warts and all, you can't react to everyone's faults. And you need to not have such high expectations that if people don't meet those expectations, they feel like they're always disappointing you. If you want to love people warts and all, you need to make sure that they don't feel like you're disappointed with them all the time. Because if people feel like they're disappointed with you all the time, that is one of the most unmotivating things in the world for true, healthy, fruitful relationship. You see, one of the things I've learned from the last year or two, stepping out and planning a church, is I have changed my views on this radically. I have decided that I am not going to live in frustration towards people. I want to have an openness towards people and I want to call out God's best in people. But if I just say, oh, Finn's a great guy, but 
He doesn't do A, B and C. What I'm doing is I'm focusing on all the things that Finn isn't and I'm neglecting the gift of God in him and what God is obviously doing in him. And do you know when we have high expectations of people and we say, yeah, yeah, they're good, but they're not as, they're not as committed as me. Or, you know, oh, oh, yeah, they did this thing, but yeah, yeah, they've still got a lot of area for growth. What you're doing is you're saying you will never reach the standard that I've put for you. And do you know the wrong thing about this? God doesn't treat you that way. God has very, very, very low expectations of you. <laughs> he has, get this though, because, because he's already in the future and he knows what you're going to do. But get this, in the future, so, so uh, this is what I believe. I should have great hopes for Finn. I should hope for the best and I should speak Speak God's best over your life and I should believe that you can change but that's not going to change by you just ticking the box of behaviour modification and sin management. It's got to come from following Jesus and Him renovating your heart so that you can actually be all that God's called you to be. And who God's called Finn to be actually might look different to what my understanding of a fully developed disciple is because you know what? I'm different to Finn. He's like artistic and creative and awesome and cool. And I'm not. And you know, and we need to stop living in disappointment and frustration. Because God, like, seriously. Now, if people abuse you or they treat you with disrespect, you don't have to put up with that. What I'm talking about is just the things that really, really don't matter. And and can we please, if people are making progress, we need to get better at calling out and celebrating progress. Because that's what. Jesus, in in the book of Ephesians, it says that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. And blessing is to eulogize someone. So when God looks at you, he eulogizes you. He speaks well of you. Imagine if God cursed you and he spoke ill of you. But God speaks well of you, so we need to do that to other people. High hopes. But Change our expectations so we don't crush people. And don't write people off as, oh, they're just a non-committed person. Oh, they're just a fake person. How do you know they're fake? How do you know what's going on in their life? Oh, they're just a clicky person. Oh, they're just mean-spirited. Oh, they're just self... How do you know what pain they're going through in their life? How dare you judge people when God, he's pretty patient with you. So as a church, even as a family, how do you know what's gone in your family members' lives? Can we be people of grace? Because that's what God has done to us. And so Jesus gives his mates a spray because they're being hypocritical. Verse 47, Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But, what, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Interesting that Jesus says her sins are already forgiven as her great love has shown. So who knows what's gone on previously in their encounters. But he's just essentially saying her act of worship is a sign of her changed heart. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Church, I wouldn't be who I am if someone didn't love me. My parents loved me, but the greatest love in my life is the love of Jesus Christ, where he hasn't just tolerated me, he has embraced me, and he has done that through the forgiveness that has been won through Christ's cross. I wonder if today you can say that. I am who I am because someone loved me. I am who I am because someone forgave me. When the sum of my life was tallied up before me. I looked and I saw that I was accepted and I was loved and I was embraced. My shame was covered and my pride was dealt with. And I was brought into God's family because of his amazing love. We're going to celebrate communion together and I'm going to invite the ushers to hand out the bread and the cup. And we at the Christian Family Centre have an open table whereby if you're from another church or Christian tradition, you can receive today. Also, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus or you're not sure where you're at, I also just believe that Jesus wouldn't exclude you from his table, but you don't feel like you have to um, participate in this communion. Communion means fellowship, something we do when we fellowship with one another and we fellowship with God.
we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, if you're here and you don't feel like you're in a place where you can participate, feel free just to let the um, trays pass you by. Once you've received your bread in the cup, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and we're going to have a time of prayer together. Once you've seen the, the, the bread and the cup, stand up, please. Do we have any sinners in the house? Wasn't a trick question. Sometimes we can have the theological answer. Oh, yeah, well, technically, Jesus doesn't remember my sins, so I'm not really... Well, no. Isn't it wonderful to be forgiven when you don't deserve it? Isn't it ridiculous? See, the goal of grace is not just to save you, it's to change you. It's to change you so that you can extend grace to others and you can extend forgiveness to others. Because there's people in your life, people in your family, and they need you to point the finger less and they need you to help them to, to make steps and to feel loved so that they can deal with the core of their life because the core of their life is that the heart is the heart of the issue for them. And that's where you can make a difference in their life. Some of us are pointing out mechanical or circumstantial issues but there's a spiritual issue going on deeper and God is wanting us to be agents of grace and mercy in response to God's grace and mercy thank you Jesus just close your eyes could you say thank you to him for your for, your, for his forgiveness thank you for your mercy in my life that you haven't given me what I deserve thank you for your grace Thank you that when I walk into the room, you don't look at everything I'm not, but you look at me as if I belong. Thank you that you accept my worship, even if it's frail and imperfect. Thank you that even when I'm a hypocrite, you don't reject me. Thank you that even when I'm stubborn, you don't reject me. Thank you that even when I fall, you pick me back up again. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of forgiveness. Thank you. Help me to continue to turn from unrighteousness, the sin in my life. I don't want to be defined by it. It's in my past. Help me to turn from self-righteousness, this idea that I am okay and I am independent. Help me to trust you more and more. Thank you, Lord. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat and remember his body that was broken for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's drink and remember his blood that was spilled for us. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can I just encourage you, if there's someone in your life and you're just saying, God, as you have extended your hand of mercy to me, I want to be used to extend your hand of mercy to people in my life. It might be someone in your family. It might be someone in your workplace. It might be someone that is resentful towards you. Can you just put your hand up as a sign of saying, I'm extending the grace that you've put in my heart. Father, I pray for every person across this room that you're wanting to, to, to change the orientation of our heart towards others because you have given us grace and mercy. Thank you, Lord. Give us an overwhelming sense that without you, we really are lost. That we are not worthy of you. Please give us 
a humility towards others. Give us an understanding that people are not machines and we need to love them. Please help us to take responsibility for our own sin and not just point out the sin in others. We thank you, Lord.